I received my power jack low frequency pure sine wave 8000 watt inverter in the mail. Um, unfortunately, it was a little bit damaged in shipping. This plastic L1 neutral L2 terminal um, apparently had been pushed in and if you look down from the top view, it bent, bent the metal faceplate. I was planning on just hooking this up to the battery in my well pump, turning it on and shooting a video showing it works or not works, one or the other. Um, but instead, I'm going to be talking about how to take the cover off and look inside, diagnose what's going on in there, make sure everything's okay, and how to start it up safely when you're just evaluating whether or not something's going to blow up on you or not. All right, first to open it up, there are six of these, three on each side. I have taken out the middle ones already, and they just have a nut on the back, and you need to lift this up slightly or reach in from the sides to be able to keep that nut from turning when you unscrew the screws. So you're going to be taking three on each side off. You also need to take these four screws here, two in the front, two in the back. Those connect into a little L bracket that take this top C-shaped top piece and hold it down. So once you take those screws out, you can just lift this top piece away. When you lift this top off, you'll want to have a place to set it, and there is a wire that connects this monitor display to the main board. It's long enough, at least in mine, so you don't have to disconnect anything. I like grabbing the sides and use that to get your finger underneath. You have to do the same thing on the other side, and then you can lift it up, watching inside for that cable. Okay, we have the DC power coming in. I have the 24 volt model. It comes in here. There's kind of the main power block, which is on the bottom, and the control board electronics on the top. These two boards here and two boards on the other side are the MOSFET boards. I really like how they're removable. You unscrew these screws, you can pull it off, um, and essentially just replace these boards if they were to blow. So I like that ability to work on it. This is a power distribution board. I don't like how it's just kind of hanging off the end here. It looks like an afterthought. Um, I might actually build some standoffs to support this a little better on the far side. Basically, this guy will convert 24 volt DC to a sine wave that's about 18 volts AC, feed it into this giant toroidal transformer, and that transformer will, on half of it, generate 110 volts, and then the other half generate the alternate phase 110 volts for split phase 240 volt inversion. Um, I bought the US version, so this outlet plug is only set up to half. It's center tapped of this transformer so that when I plug something in there, it's 110 volts. The only way I can get 240 volts in both, both halves of that split phase is to hook into the L1, L2 neutral connector on the front. So what I'm looking for is things like make sure these wires are not rubbing against this fan. So when I first opened it up, these wires would prevent that fan from turning on. Um, so I had to move them a little bit so that fan could spin. I also want to check that these connections are strong and not going to pull out of these push-to-fit connectors. Um, and I kind of generally looked around and made sure everything looked okay. But you really can't tell if it's going to work or not until you turn it on. So I'm going to show you how to apply power in a relatively safe manner. So I have here a variable voltage and current power supply. It will feed a short and limit it with the current limit. It goes 0 to 3 amps and it'll do 0 to 30 volts, which is a good match for this input since it's a 24 volt inverter. I also have some little extra ring terminals that'll fit over these posts and that'll just make it easier for me to attach my alligator clips to these posts because those posts are really big to try to attach an alligator clip to. Notice I have this thing set at zero volts because I'm going to start this off at zero volts. If I had it up at 24 volts and touched it to the clips it would spark because inside there's some capacitors that are going to draw a lot of current initially. All right, on the front panel, I don't want this on power save, and I don't want it on power save off because both of those are on. I want it in the middle, which is the inverter turned off. Um, this switch here I have flipped over, which basically disables the automatic transfer switch type setup. Um, it has to do with if you're using this as a UPS and you have solar power coming in, I just have it turned off. Um, the fan I have turned on because I want the fan in the back to be on all the time. 
All right, let's go apply power. Okay, so I have these guys hooked up. This wire and these connections are only good for a couple of amps, but that's okay because this little guy here can't do more than three amps. So when I turn it on, zero voltage. Nothing's gonna happen until I turn this voltage up. I'm turning it up slowly. You can see that as I turn it up, it starts drawing an amp or so and then goes down very quickly. So once I hit something like 24 volts, the system is basically ready to go and now it's drawing very little amps. So the large capacitors inside have charged themselves up and we don't have any sparking, which is good since we started that voltage going up slowly. All right, so let's take a look inside now. All right, so we have the main power board and you'll notice there's some green LEDs on these MOSFET boards. So there's two MOSFET boards on this side that have two green LEDs. And then there's two MOSFET boards on this side and you might notice that it's missing a green LED over there. So this is what I encountered when I first opened it up and that's why I was a little worried to do a full load test with it. Notice on the top, however, there's no green LEDs on the rest of this. So it's turned off, but the MOSFET boards still are getting power directly from these terminals which would normally be going to a battery bank. So let's turn it on. Notice the fan turned on. Notice also we have a lot of green LEDs all over the place. So supposedly it's making AC power, which we can plug into this guy here and verify. So I have here just a four or five watt LED light attached to a kilowatt hour meter with a plug-in lead. Um, this universal plug is kind of weird but as long as you remember the ground goes up to the top, you'll find that you can just plug into it as normal with a standard outlet. All right, so we're going to turn it back on again. My light has turned on, and we are producing 115, 116 volts. The amps are basically unmeasurable because it's a tiny little light. The watts here, it's drawing something like 2, maybe 3 watts. The hertz rating is interesting, so it's right at 60 hertz, which is good. That means that the waveform it's producing is at least the right frequency. This doesn't show us the waveform, but the power voltage, it's actually powering the light, and the frequency seems okay. Now, if you have an oscilloscope, this is where you'd want to hook up your oscilloscope to these line one, line two neutral sets and take a look at the power. So I did that and it looked beautiful. It was a nice sine wave. So as far as I can tell, with a tiny little one or two watt light bulb load, this unit is functioning perfectly. However, I am worried about this light not being here because they put that indicator light on there for a reason. So I'm gonna to go to power jack and say, hey, what's up with this? Should I put a big load on it and test it or do you wanna send me a new MOSFET board to have me replace it? So I contacted PowerJack via eBay, and they said, we'll send you a new MOS board. And they DHL'd it from China. It took about five, six days. They actually sent me a pack with two of these MOS boards and the low-frequency driver circuit. Now, I'm pretty sure the low-frequency driver circuit on my unit is just fine because my sine wave looked beautiful, and none of these chips were blown up, and, and it looked visibly good, and the green light was on. Um, these guys here are for my 24 volt um, system. The part numbers match. Also, the numbers on these MOSFETs match. Um, with the exception, the part number matches, but the very bottom number is slightly different. Um, it's probably just a batch difference. So I'm going to replace one of these guys with the one with the light that doesn't turn on, and then give this thing a shot. When you're working on one of these guys, something you need to keep in mind is that there are several large capacitors hidden underneath that control board, and they will retain power for quite a while. You can see those two MOSFET board lights are on, and the power is 24 volts. My power supply is feeding that right now, but I'm going to turn off the power supply. It'll um, turn off. I'm actually disconnecting here. So essentially, you'll notice that it's still at 23 volts. Now it's slowly going down, but you can see those two green lights are still on there. Um, so it does look like they have a small resistance across the um, uh, 
capacitors to slowly bleed it down, although maybe that's just my multimeter that's causing this bleed down. Um, but it's not going terribly, terribly fast. So you want to wait a good amount of time for those capacitors to discharge. And you certainly don't want to work on it while those lights are lit. Now, if you want it to discharge faster, you can get a resistor that's a large value. This one here is about 500 kilo ohms. You could probably go down to maybe 100 kilo ohms. Anything less than that, you'd be start melting your resistor potentially. Um, and then you can attach that across the terminals here and that will cause the power to bleed off into that resistor. And so you can see here it's starting to go down a little bit faster than before. But it's still taking a decent amount of time. So you need to test the voltage on these terminals, make sure it's down at a pretty low level, you know, less than a volt or so before you start messing around inside of it. All right, I've been waiting several minutes. I got tired of waiting. I switched my uh, resistor down to a 100K resistor instead of a 500K resistor. Um, we're still at 8 volts. I'm getting bored of waiting, so I'm just going to uh, touch across here and short it out. Um, now, you wouldn't want to do that initially without having bleeding bled it down, um, but now at this point there's not much power left when it's down at 6 or 7 volts, and you can see here now we're at basically 0 volts and the lights are off. I'm actually going to leave these two terminals attached between the negative and positive terminals here, and that will keep it safe so while I'm working on it. So these six screws here are just Phillips head screws. The little nuts here, I was able to get a 5.5 millimeter socket on them, um, or you can just use an adjustable wrench. I don't have a lot of wrenches that small size to work on those. So because the replacement board did not come with this aluminum heat sink bar on the back, I thought I was supposed to take these guys off, but um, it doesn't appear to be coming out. So I'm going to take these three Phillips screws and take those off and see what's going on with that. All right, when I took those three screws out, this assembly lifts out much nicer. All right, so I dropped those six screws out, and then I'm able to just kind of pull this guy off and the adhesive just comes off pretty nicely. So the countersinks here are in the back and the screws go through that to the front. All right, to tighten each of these MOSFETs aren't the aluminum heat spreader plate. I'm just grabbing the nut with the adjustable wrench and then tightening the screw from the back. All right, I tightened these five power connectors and the signal or switching connector first. These guys I just had loosely in there to kind of hold it in place. And now that it's in there, I'm going to tighten the top guys nice and tight. There's a decent amount of clearance on these holes, so it can kind of align on its own a little bit. The tolerances aren't terribly precise. Uh, but you do want to make sure this is nice and tight to that aluminum plate on the back so heat can get transferred out and dissipated. So if you look at how these guys are laid out, both of these two are attached to that same heat sink and positive power rail. So these guys are operating in parallel. So it's certainly possible that one of them had failed and the other one was carrying the load. And that would work fine in a low current test like I did, but if I put a lot of uh, draw on this, it might have blown out the other one as well. So now we've replaced this guy. I'm gonna power it back up, make sure the light turns on, and then we can do some actual high power tests success. We have green lights on both of those MOSFET power boards. Okay, I have this guy powering it. It's drawing 0 0.01 amps, so a relatively small 10 milliamps. That's just powering the blue or the green indicator lights and just having the thing sitting there ready to turn on. So I'm going to turn it on without the fan. And now you can see it's drawing 1.15 amps at 23.7 volts. Um, so I have this light here, it's you know 2 or 3 watt load. Um, it's producing 110 volts going out there, um, lighting up that light. So it's draw, kind of pretty much idle draw, is just a little above 1 amp with the fan off.
turned on the fan, it's gone up to 1.4. So that fan is a difference of about 0.3 amps. So here with it off, it's 1.15, 1.16. And then when you turn it on, it goes up to about 1.38, 1.4 amps. So the fan is, is not a large draw, and the benefit of that active cooling on the heat sinks is definitely worth that power draw. Now, we're going to try some voltage. Increase this voltage up and wait until it gets to the high voltage alert. So I'm at 28, 29, 29. Well, it's not giving me a high voltage alert. I was kind of expecting a high voltage alert before I hit 30 volts, but oh well. Let's go the other way and see about a low voltage alert. Low battery voltage. Oh, there we go. Alright, so it shut down about 19 volts. I'm going to turn it off. Let me go back up. So no, it's not automatically recovering. If it has a low voltage, if it has a low voltage shutdown, you have to turn the power on and off on yourself to get it back on. Okay, here we are. It's running 21 volts. Oh, no, nope, low battery. All right, so 21.5, you have alarm. I'm going to go up a little bit. 22 has a beep. It's beeping at me. I think the 22.2 .2 is the lowest I want my lithium ion cells. So I kind of like the fact that it's beeping at me at 22. I'm going to go up to 22.7. Still beeping. I'm 23.6. It seems like at 23.6 it has stopped beeping at me. I'm going to back it down. 23 23.2, 23.1, 23.0, 22.7, 22.4. Looks like 22.3, 22.4, 22.2, somewhere there's when this thing first starts. So let's look at the actual shutdown. So I'm down to 21 volts, 21.4, 21.3. There I'm at 20.9 volts. Okay, that was 20.8. So it looks like right around 21 volts is when this thing completely shuts down and stops drawing much current there. All right, after you get the cover back on, take a little screwdriver and make sure this fan can spin freely. When I received it from the factory, that was not the case. There were some wires stuck up in there, and if the temperature sensor on the transformer had just tried to turn on the fan, it would have just been stuck. So at least now, if the transformer temperature sensor gets high enough to turn on this fan, um, it can turn on. Okay, I have the big wires hooked up. Time to get the battery. How to hook it up to the battery. Currently, the battery is active. I'm going to disconnect the main disconnect so there's no actual current that flows into this guy here. This guy here is also at zero volts. Then we have to get the Herkin Big connectors connect together. Notice that the negative goes to negative, positive goes to positive. It's keyed, that's the only way it'll go in. Now, my absolute fail-safe disconnect is grab this handle and yank real hard. But, let's try out our pre-charge circuit. So, push the button, it charges up, we're at 13 volts, 14 volts, 16 volts, 18 volts. It's equalizing the capacitor slowly, and we're up to 22.4, 22.9, 23 volts. So now the capacitors in the inverter are basically equalized with the battery and it's safe to turn on the main disconnect. So I'm still holding this down, turn it on, now I can release this, and now there's no current flowing through the pre-charge circuit. It's all going through the main 200 amp um, circuit breaker. 
and we're at 24.5 volts, zero amps. It's actually drawing 0 0.01 amp. We know that because we measured it with a more accurate meter. But, you know, it's not drawing much when the inverter is turned off. So let's turn on the inverter. And now we have 1.2 amp draw, 1.4 amp sometimes, so it's kind of 1.2 to 1.4. This current sensor is not extremely accurate, but it's getting in the right general range here. So about 30 watts of draw, just idle, just sitting there. This is the first real load test, a resistive space heater, which is about the nicest type of load you can give an inverter. So we're going to turn the space heater on. I don't know if it's in low or high power mode right now. It looks like it might be low mode. It's drawing 700, 800, 1000, 1100 watts, 1200 watts, 1300 watts, 1400, 1537. All right, I think it's in high mode. It's drawing about 1500 watts out of the 110 volt outlet. That's about as much power as I want to draw out of half of that transformer because it's about a 3000 watt transformer and it's 1500 watts on each of the two legs. So I'm only on one leg because this is a 110 volt space heater, but it's running just fine. Let's go look at the battery side of things and see what the draw is. I have about 1400 watts right now. All right, on the battery side, we are drawing 1.5 kilowatts, 63 amps at 23.8 volts. And it looks like my amp hour counting meter thinks we've gone down an amp hour because I'm at 109 amp, no, 108 amp hours now. So it's dragging stuff out of my battery relatively quickly. But I wish this guy gave me a little more accuracy instead of just 1.5 or 1.5 kilowatts, but using the 64 amps and 23.7 volts, I can calculate a more accurate number and calculate efficiency. So if you take this 1400 watt output and divide it by the 1536 watts that were being drawn from the battery, we get a very respectable 91% efficiency number here. Now this is ARN, the nicest load you can get. It's a pure resistive load. Um, and this is the highest efficiency I ever measured for this inverter. Um, but I never saw it go below 80% even ARN um, harder loads. Okay, we have a vacuum which has an electric motor. This is similar to a well pump motor, but not quite as powerful. So let's see how this guy does. Well, my meter just flashed and died. Oh, meter's coming back. All right, the meter claims this is zero watts and zero amps, 115 volts. Oh, there's the watt. Okay, 870 watts. So this motor takes 875 watts, about seven amps, and there was a big surge. You saw the meter die when it started up. So I can run a seven amp motor at 110 volts and it handled the power startup surge with no problem. The meter had a little problem with the startup surge. This is good news because my well pump draws about 9 to 10 amps at 240 volts. And so if I'm able to handle a 7 amp motor at 110 volts, it's probably going to be able to handle a 9 amp motor on the full transformer. We'll find out for sure when I hook it up to the well pump. All right, this is the largest motor I could find that I can easily carry in here and plug into the 112 volt outlet. It is a 1.3 running horsepower portable air compressor. So let's see if my meter and or the inverter will power this thing. Alright, the meter blanks out and resets itself when we start this thing up, so I'm going to focus on the meter this time while I run the air compressor.
All right, that was about 8.5 amps and about 800 watts. Let's take a look at the voltage and see how much the voltage sags when this thing turns on. All right, so it sagged from about 116 idle down to 112, 113 when it first started up, and it was running it at about 114, so only about a 2-volt sag. That's pretty good. So this is a monster of a microwave. It's a full 1800-watt microwave, extra-large size. And you can hear the beeping on my meter here, because my meter's complaining that I'm drawing more than 15 amps through it. It's drawing about 16 amps, and if you look at the wattage, it's um, 1,800 watts. Um, the frequency stays good, and the voltage stays good. So this inverter is definitely able to handle pretty much anything you could plug into a standard 15 amp outlet. Being able to run 120 volt appliances off of this inverter is a great feature, but I really bought it to run a 240 volt well pump. As you can see, I've mounted it to the wall here, and it has ran my well pump. However, there are some gotchas and some issues, which I'm going to be covering in my next video.